Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is David Kalsen. Uh, David is a shareholder, which is equivalent to a senior partner at Denton's Cohen and Grigsby, and also the lead on the Venture Technology Group. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Spencer. I'm delighted to be here. Hey, I'm pleased to have you. I uh, appreciated you um, coming forward and saying you were a fan of the podcast, and uh, just you know, glad to have you as a guest. Well, you know, I like to you know share stories about uh, the farm, my work, Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, these are all of great interest to me, and I know you're doing a lot to promote that. So I'm happy to help out with maybe a different perspective than you're used to getting on your on your podcast. Thanks. Yeah, we usually have uh, like you know executives at technology companies and <clears throat> I guess engineers and um, I don't know. That's that's mainly it. So yeah, you're the first lawyer to come on, but you do a lot of work in the tech space. I mean, you're the lead at the Venture Technology Group. I see you at every single Pittsburgh Robotics Network event. Uh, I mean, the firm sponsors the organization, right? So. We, ca we, care, we care very deeply about robotics, which is something that I just, I, I wouldn't say I fell into it. You don't really fall into these things. You make your opportunities if you do what I do for a living, if you're a business lawyer. But fundamentally, what I've done ever since I started getting into technology in the late 90s is to find out where Pittsburgh is leading. You know what's happening where Pittsburgh is is really uh, growing by leaps and bounds, maybe leading the world. Uh, that's certainly what's happened with robotics, and and that's what we do is we help companies like that. That's that's our highest and best use as lawyers, is to work with entrepreneurs, and and funders to put together a company that you know really has a chance of succeeding. We can't make it succeed on our own, but we can try to facilitate it. Cool. And, uh, you know, robotics in the late 90s, early 2000s, was kind of a, an answer to a question that no one was asking. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. They were really interested in developing the most uh, advanced technologies because they're roboticists. And they, they wanted to create something path-breaking. And they did. Uh, but from a business perspective, <laughs> it wasn't answering a pain in the marketplace. Yep. The market, I've seen that story quite a bit. Right? The, mar the market wasn't ready for it. They just, they, it just wasn't. There was way too much uh, additional work that needed to be done. And the robotics had to become untethered from the lab. You know, you can't walk around with a Cray supercomputer. <laughs> so, you know, advanced microchips made, made, a, made a huge difference. And, and uh, you know, in the, around 2003, 2004, so much was happening at NRAC, the National Robotics Engineering Center, and uh, in, in applied research, taking this pure research and then seeing how can we apply it to industry. And that's really when, when we got involved. And, and it was at the early stages of robotics actually answering questions, actually solving a pain in the marketplace, doing something way faster, better, cheaper, more efficiently. That's when, that's when we got into it. So just to, to kind of circle back, was NREC your first robotics client then? My first robotics client actually uh, was, was uh, Seagrid. Oh, cool. But, 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 but indirectly, um, because we represented the largest investor in Seagrid. And, uh, you know, I Can really- Can I ask who that was, just because I don't know their investor? Probably. Well, it, I, this is very public. It was yeah. Giant Eagle. Oh, cool. Giant Eagle was their first big investor. We represented Giant Eagle in their investment in Seagrid. And I got to know the founder of the company. We really hit it off. Uh, and then for a period of time, I, I did work directly with Seagrid and Giant Eagle, which is a little unusual and not something that is really sustainable because eventually they, they have differing interests. That but that sense. really was my gateway, if you will, to robotics. And it was a good gateway. Nice. And, and through that, I met John Bears. And John Bears had been the uh, director of the National Robotics Engineering Center at CMU, NRAC. Yep. for 15 years 
Interesting and, dude. I've actually not met him face to face yet, except like maybe more than once. John is an exceptional roboticist and an exceptional human being. It's been a privilege to have known and worked with him all the years that I have. Cool. And, uh, you know, he had, re he had, I think he had grown frustrated by the limits of creating robotics in a university. You can only take it so far. You can kind of take it up to the transom and you can look through it to the other side where it's commercialized, but that's not what universities do. So uh, I worked with John. We strategized for months and months on how to spin his company out of CMU while still keeping a lot of the people at CMU, a lot of the talent at CMU. We came up with a way to do it. Interesting. And Carnegie Robotics was born. Cool. I'd be curious to hear about the logistics of how you did that. Well, we had to figure out a way. Uh, when you're working with universities, there's all kinds of university policies that come into play for their research and for their faculty. So, you know, it, it's not rocket science to start a company. I've been doing that my entire career. So that's like, you know, mother's milk is, is creating a new company for entrepreneurs. Although I will say it helps to have 35 years of experience. I'm sure. So you can like help them think about, well, what's the end game? How do we get there? And therefore, how do we start? So that, that, that is, you know, where we begin. Uh, uh, but, you know, for NRAC or, or for Carnegie Robotics, it was really a question of how can we work collaboratively with the university and still pursue this, this for-profit arrangement. And, you know, we were able to work our way through the labyrinth of university policies. John was on fantastic terms with the university. They were very, is, as far as very supportive. And, you know, we were off to the races. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking to uh, my friend Brian Beyer the other day, and um, I don't know if you know him at all, but he just... Yeah, he was, yeah. A, he was at Carnegie Robotics for a number of years. Yeah, he, yeah, he was one of their C-suite. I think he was the chief product officer, but I yeah. might be wrong on that. Um, but he was saying he did... Like John Bayer's got his best work out of him. Was his, his quote on John? I oh, I think John here. gets the best out of pretty much everyone who works for him. And you know, Carnegie Robotics was flourishing yeah. uh, until uh, well, not until, and then John got a call from Travis Kalanick, the CEO of Uber, the founder and CEO of Uber, quite a a character in his own right who had decided that Uber needed to build an autonomous vehicle. And he had looked the world over and concluded that the best team was right here in Pittsburgh. And so within 45 days, which is incredibly short, we had done the transaction to create Uber Advanced Technology Group. It must have been a wild 45 days. It was, a wild, it, it, was a, <laughs> it was a wild 45 days. If you ever want to know what it's like to deal with Uber, those 45 days were quite an eye opener. <laughs> and so, you know, the company was created. That tells me nothing about what it's like to deal with Uber. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, it was something else. And, yeah, you know, sure. Uber, in a sense, if I can go biblical, sure. begat Argo, uh, because people had then left uh, Uber to form Argo. Meanwhile, you have Aurora forming, you have Motive. So this, this yeah. uh, onslaught of major autonomous vehicle companies I mean, feels to me like it, it, it really, all these guys came out of NREC and then some of them came out of CRL. So that was the, really the beginning. It's almost a tsunami of autonomous vehicles. And, and Pittsburgh is known for that. But, you know, in addition to that, we have a hundred other companies who are doing other things in robotics that are not autonomous vehicles for the road. And those companies are born here and most importantly, Spencer, they stay here, you know, for decades. In my early work as a technology lawyer, I was frustrated that when talent coming out of CMU or other companies would, would form an exciting company and they would get funded by a venture capital firm, they would pick up and they would move to Austin or Boston or Silicon Valley. You can move a software company in a weekend. <laughs> you, you know, you, you slap your laptop shut, you hop on a plane, and you fly out to the valley. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and so we were doing a great job at giving birth to companies, but we were having trouble keeping them. Robotics, yeah. the companies stay here because it's the perfect place in the world to start and grow a robotics company. This is our Silicon Valley. Um, we have a critical mass of terrific robotics companies so that when something happens like happened recently with Argo, yep. when it's, you know, main funders decided that they didn't want to keep funding the, the uh, development of a, an autonomous vehicle and basically shut down the company, uh, a number of people were able to find jobs instantaneously at other robotics companies in Pittsburgh. Oh, it was a it was a mad dash to hire those folks. I, I remember, I got those spreadsheets too. <laughs> oh, I sat in board meetings with my other clients. And said we're going after this person and this person and that person, yeah. trying to get them. That that kind of critical mass never existed before in any technology industry in Pittsburgh. We're trying to build that with life sciences, but we have, and there's a lot going on. It's exciting, but we have a long way to go. But with robotics. We're there, uh, and it's really gratifying. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. How do you feel about, uh, and maybe this is too controversial, but I'll ask anyway, we can edit it out if you don't want to say. How do you feel about the Pittsburgh v. Boston for like the best robotic city debate? I mean, well, it's a healthy competition, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, look, Steelers versus the Patriots, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we have a nice competition going. <laughs> look, Boston has a number of great universities. And they have a tremendous amount of venture capital. They have, you know, 10, 50, I don't know, 50 times the venture capital we have in Pittsburgh. So that's a built in advantage. I can uh, see that. But what we have is industrial space. I mean, Pittsburgh builds things, right? We were number one in steel for 100 years. And between the steel industry and all the industries that were ancillary to it, that fed into it, we have, you know, thousands and thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of acres of industrial space that is the perfect place to build robots uh, at a fraction of the cost of doing that same thing in Boston or the silk, in, in the valley. Right? Yeah, and I, I don't even bring the valley up because, I mean, I don't know, this might be controversial as well, but I don't think they're in the same league as Pittsburgh and Boston on robotics. Like, I think we're, we've come ahead of them. Uh, well said. Yeah. Uh, I won't disagree with you. And there's just a different zeitgeist. Um, you know, Pittsburgh is a, it's funny. You know, we think of ourselves as a working class town. We certainly were when I grew up here, right? When I was a little kid, I would, when my parents would drive me back from my uh, aunts and uncles uh, along the parkway late at night, I'd fall asleep in the back seat of my car with the rivers on fire from all of the steel mills that were going 24 hours a day. I've heard these stories from my... Uh, yeah, yeah. It, 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 was, it was an amazing experience. It, when it was the, you know, we were sort of trending towards the end of the steel industry. And uh, it was so painful for Pittsburgh because the work ethic in Pittsburgh is second to none. But there was no work. Uh, really? once, once the steel... Uh, industry moved to the south, overseas. Uh, all these workers were, you know, dislocated. Eventually, once they came to terms with the fact that the steel industry wasn't coming back, they went elsewhere. You know, those are the people who show up at Steeler games all over the country. We lived in Ithaca, New York for a while, and there's still Steelers bars even there. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> people scattered everywhere. Uh, it was it was the great diaspora, uh, but that that work ethic is still a part of who we are, and I see that I see that carrying over to robotics. When once again we're number one, maybe we're tied for number one, but I like to think we're number one, and and part of that is that we just we know how to work hard, we know how to build things, and there's not a lot of pretense. Um, and we just go out and get it done. That's, That's a great, great way of putting it. I, uh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty it's special place. place. Yeah, no, I love it here. I mean, my whole family lives in New York City, uh, me and my parents and my brother and sister except me. And you mentioned you opted not to be there as an attorney, which I feel like that's like the place for lawyers. 
So what made you decide to stay here instead of going there? So when I graduated from law school, from Pitt, in yeah. 19, uh, to work at law school, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was lucky. I was an undergrad at Pitt uh, in the mid-70s. I spent a year backpacking around the world. Nice. Yeah, Jealous. I did that. Uh, I, I knew I was going to become a lawyer, and I thought I had my whole life to be a lawyer. I think I'm going to spend a year getting to see the world. Right? Where'd you go? Can I ask? I was all over Europe, uh, North Africa, and the Middle East. I love I love North Africa yeah. so much. Was, I haven't done the Middle East yet. It was great. I lived on a kibbutz in Israel for oh, six awesome. months. And, that's great. Uh, you know, I managed to live for a year traveling on probably a thousand dollars, as I recall. For, for a year. year. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Well. When you live on a kibbutz, that, that helps. Well, if it was the 70s, I'm sure I'm your grand went a lot further than it would today. It did. It did. It, uh, I look back on it kind of with amazement. And I would recommend that anyone do it. Everyone's in a hurry to get into their careers. And I love travel. I, it's I, the you know, greatest. This is, this is when you get out of school or even before you go to school, if you're not sure, that's the time to do it. Because sooner or later, you do find your career. You have a family, and uh, it's harder to do that, right? Life, life just speeds by. So do it while you can. But, but uh, uh, I went to New York out of law school to a terrific firm on, on Park Avenue, and I had two great years doing the kind of thing that Park Avenue lawyers do. <laughs> and very gratifying. But you know what bothered me about New York? And my daughter, by the way, lives in New York. She yeah. lives in Brooklyn. She's an assistant managing editor for Forbes. She went oh, cool. to Barnard. So she's a died in the wool New Yorker. Nice. But what bothered me about New York was the anonymity of it all. Yeah, I always liked that about it, to be honest. That's... Well, I think a lot of people do. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you during the day, you have 12 million people living there and probably 6 million of them want to be left alone, uh, <laughs> if not more. Uh, but I felt like I felt disconnected. And when my wife and I were married, and she's from Pittsburgh, we thought about where do we want to raise a family. And New York in the mid 80s was not a happy place. It was really probably the, the depth that New York could sink into. Yeah, makes sense. My it dad was, tells me about Times Square before it became it, it was what we terrible. Today. It yeah. was terrible. Yeah, I just it was hard to imagine. Forty Second Street. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. And and I didn't you know we didn't work far from there, and uh, so we thought, well, where are we going to live? So we could live anywhere but New York, and we could live in Pittsburgh. So uh, we were ha both having been from here, and having family here, and thinking about raising our kids. We said. Let's go back to Pittsburgh. Now, at that point, Pittsburgh had just been ranked number one in the first issue of the Places Rated Almanac of U.S. News. I think it was U.S. News and World Report. The world was stunned. How does Pittsburgh end up number one? Well, you know, it was very uh, you know, highly ranked in terms of cost of living, amenities, health care, topography. Right, we know how topography. How, yeah, because uh, Pittsburgh has become a beautiful city once the steel mill shut oh, down. Oh, gotcha. So right? it's the hills and the yeah, the yeah. One yeah. one of the benefits was you could see the damn place, right? Yeah, you could see sense. how you can't beautiful really it was. Do that in Manhattan, and uh, unless you have a drone or a helicopter. Yeah, look, yeah. I mean, if if you live in San Francisco, I mean, what matches that topography? But on the other hand, there's a lot of other things about San Francisco that are really difficult. Correct. So. We decided to come back, and I joined my firm when it was a young firm, 25 lawyers, just getting started. It spun out of This Reed would have been Smith. Cohen and Grigsby at the time. Yeah, that was Cohen and Grigsby. I didn't know Grigsby. you were a Reed Smith spin yeah. out. That's interesting. It's, it came out of Reed Smith in 1981. Do you know and, Ansel Schwartz? Or sure. He was a yeah, colleague of mine for a number of years. That's awesome. Yeah, terrific IP Good lawyer. Good dude. I like that guy a lot. Yeah, Greg, he was a terrific IP lawyer. But I joined it when it was just getting started, that was in 86. And uh, I came because uh, I knew that I needed to spend the next 10 years of my career learning everything I could. I wanted the best mentors I could get. And to me, hands down, those were my mentors at Cohen and Grigsby. Chuck Cohen, the name partner, Henry Cohen, Hugh Nevin. These names aren't immediately recognizable to younger business people in the city but they're top flight lawyers. Nice. And I was very lucky because I came of age before the internet. So uh, 
we actually have time as lawyers to <laughs> get an assignment, think about things, talk about them, and get an answer to the client. They didn't expect it in 30 seconds. Uh, and so I was lucky. So Even I got my that. training and I, you know, I was off to the races. You I never got those frantic phone calls of like, I need to do it now, they're trying to close the deal. No, we because we it. couldn't. No, yeah. one, no one demanded it because they knew we couldn't provide it. That's fair. You know, every technological leap has made the lives of lawyers uh, <laughs> like exponentially more difficult. But that's okay. Believe me, no one's, no one's shedding a tear for me. Uh, <laughs> but it did, it did change things. But, but, you know, I came back to Pittsburgh and uh, about, the, about the mid 90s, I could see what was happening with technology. I looked at my skill set, what I had been trained to do, uh, work with businesses, work with people, understand people. I liked working with entrepreneurs. I didn't really like working with big companies and middle managers at big companies. Perfectly it's wonderful. Different breed. Uh, yeah, different breed, wonderful people. But what drove them was not what drove entrepreneurs. I agree. Right? Yep. So uh, I kind of took to it. I, I didn't know anything about it. I had to teach myself everything. And that's what I did for the next, you know, 25 years. That's awesome. Was, you know, learn it. That's interesting, though, because I, I feel like we're, you know, still kind of figuring out what our ideal client is right now. And I think it's somewhere between... It's probably a medium-sized tech firm or a venture capitalist. It's, it's companies that are building tech, but they don't have enough resources to do it fast enough. I'm, I'm talking about the work we do as contract engineers at SKA. Sure. But we've also talked to Fortune 50s and Fortune 500s, and those are, I feel like you come across the middle manager more there. And then we've worked with pre-seed startups where they're great, they're, they're awesome, there's that hustle attitude, I love it. But then the problem is, you know, you, it just gets too sad to see them, you know, forge a relationship and then they go out of business because they run out of money. And yeah. you do that over and, and over and, again. Like and it's also this. nice to get paid for your work. Correct. Um, <laughs> so. And, and so it, you have to have a cast iron stomach uh, to do what I do as a technology lawyer because you are going to have clients that eventually, for whatever reason, can't pay you what they owe you, that go out of business despite your best efforts. Yep. Uh, that's part of the deal okay but you also have clients who are fantastic who are great to work with who are creative and inventive and collaborative and interesting and you can help them succeed and when you do that for a client to me there's nothing else that a business lawyer can do that compares with that you know if you're a litigator you're always in a fight <laughs> right? You're fighting with the other side, you're fighting with your own client, you're fighting with the court. You know, it's a zero sum game. If you're a business lawyer, you're trying to create something. If you're a business lawyer working on big deals, you kind of go from one big deal to another, and they're pretty much the same. If you're a business lawyer for technology companies, early stage companies, well, every client is completely different. What they're creating is different. Who they are is different. The personalities are different. It helps to be a little ADD, yeah, uh, which I have no doubt work that I must be. <laughs> I've never been diagnosed, but I'm self-diagnosed because if I'm working on 10 or 15 clients a day and I like it, then to me, that's like the definition. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so I, I feel like um, I'm definitely similarly wired to you in that regard. I, I like a challenge. I like getting my head around a new problem. And it's fascinating to hear that, that that translates to law as well as tech. I mean, it's tech law, so it's, it's still tech, but... It, it definitely translates. W one of the luckiest things about my career, Spencer, has been that every day I learn something new. I mean, I've been doing this now for almost 40 years, and there is not a day that goes by that I don't learn something new every day and think, oh, that's really interesting. I'm going to have to use that someday, what I just learned, <laughs> right? And I may end up using it the very next day. But, you know, no, nothing is rote. I've got a mentor, and I, I went to him one time when I was working on an internal research and development project, and I made what I thought was a rookie mistake. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but something where, 
you know, we, we came up against some engineering problem that maybe we could have not come up against if we'd have known better. And I just remember kind of saying, I felt defeated. I went up to him and I'm just like, you know, I, I feel like an idiot. You know, we didn't have to screw up in that way. We spent all this money. And he said, the day I stop learning new things is the day I quit research and development. <laughs> uh, that's true. And I will tell you, uh, to reassure you even further, that you may learn from your successes. And if, your failures. If you're lucky. If you're lucky, you learn from your successes. Uh, I've, but I've actually known a number of uh, entrepreneurs who have been lucky in timing. Look, they're good. You make your own luck. But they have been extremely fortunate in timing. They've been incredibly successful. Uh, some of them attribute it partly to luck and part to skill. When you fail at something, when some, you learn, the lessons you learn are so much more acute. They stay with you and they inform your thinking going forward. And because you have an entire career ahead of you, you have plenty of time to put those lessons to work, you know, for your next group of clients or for you. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. awesome. I, I, I love that mentality and I, I feel like I couldn't agree more. It doesn't feel so good that when it happens, I, you know, mind wow. you, right? It's painful. But then if you, can, if you can compartmentalize, put a little distance between yourself and whatever it was, you say, okay, I learned from that. I'm not going to make that mistake again. And then yeah. maybe you will make it again, but you won't make it a third time. All right? I mean, that's yeah. just the nature of people. That's, that's a healthy way to look at it, I yeah. think. Yeah, because I, I, I used to think, you know, I, I don't mind making a mistake so long as I don't repeat that mistake. Right. And that comes from the same mentor I mentioned yeah. before. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I keep a journal and I've talked about this on the podcast a lot. So I'm sorry if you're listening. I've said this already. But every time I screw up in business, which is it happens, <laughs> it happens a decent amount. You know, I, I and anyone that says it doesn't is lying. And um, I write down what happened, I, I analyze it, I ruminate on it, I think about it. It's not because I want to ruminate or beat myself up, it's because I, I want to learn from it and become a better professional. And so I have a bulleted list at the top of the journal where I take um, the lessons and I think if I did everything in this bulleted list, I wouldn't repeat any of those mistakes again. And it's a little cumbersome. I probably got to delete five or ten bullet points. I maybe have like 36 at this point. But well, you're very disciplined about it. I admire that. Thank you. But I can assure you, you're, you'll make a list of 10 things. There's an 11th mistake out there. Of course. Waiting in the bushes. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just the nature of business uh, and life, by the way. Uh, but, you know, exactly. You know, the years, the years pass and you learn these things. And I will say, uh, again, w one of the things that not again, because I haven't said it before, but I'll say it here, is one of the things about my career that's so rewarding is, you know, I've been doing it for 40 years, and that accumulated wisdom is valued. There's a lot of professions, there's a lot of careers in technology where people, for some reason, tend to age out pretty early. You know, I know... So we talked about my dad being a surgeon, for instance. Yeah. Those guys tap out at 50. But he was able to transform into non-surgical uh, medicine That's and, true. and able to continue to enjoy it. Yeah. But I've seen, you know, a lot of people in their you know, late 40s and 50s who were replaced by younger, uh, younger people. So give me an example of a profession that you're talking about. Well, I'm talking about, you know, software engineers and developers. Interesting. Right. I mean, these are guys who and gals who have learned a tremendous amount. Uh, but as the years have gone by, they've become more expensive to yep. employ. And then someone buys the company or someone comes in to run it. They're looking for cost cutting. The first thing they look at is, you know, how can we say, well, we can get rid of this person over here and bring in this younger person who's probably as good, if not better. Short-sighted. Pay them half. Yes, I think it's short-sighted. I mean, and, and, and my career as a lawyer lawyers are really valued for that experience. I don't know why other industries aren't. I'm not sure why in the ad industry it's so focused on, on younger people. I guess it's a younger demographic. But I, my closest friend growing up has worked in the ad industry his entire career. Oh, cool. He knows everything. And he's been really successful. But what he does, he, it's not the kind of thing that gets displaced by younger people. 
but you know I've seen it, and uh, you know it's uh, it shouldn't work that way. That yeah. that experience should be valued. But this is from my perspective. I don't disagree. Yeah. I, I know I did. I would have disagreed when I was a student and I didn't have a whole lot of experience. Right. You would have looked and said, ah, that, that person's do the same a thing that old guy can do. Dinosaur. He's a yeah. dinosaur. He doesn't know what I know. Yeah. And that's true. He probably doesn't know that, but he knows a lot more that you don't know. And what yeah, you really sure. need is the collaboration, right? You need. Well, what was humbling to me was, first of all, falling on my ass over and over and over again through making mistakes. And. Secondly, just having older, smarter mentors who had been there and done it and seen seen it go wrong 10,000 ways that I hadn't seen yet and, you know, could see three moves ahead of me because of that knowledge and experience. So, yeah, I, I, mean, I agree with you. Well, it's 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 been rewarding. Uh, and, and it's also been rewarding because it it exposes you in a way to the community. You become part of the community, whether it's the tech community or the larger community. And you realize you're able to make, you know, contributions in a number of ways that leads to a very satisfying life. Again, very different from the anonymity of New York. You know, I <laughs> guess sure. if you've got, you know, a hundred million dollars or five hundred million dollars or whatever it is, you can be known in New York. You can join, you know, big boards and your voice is heard. Uh, but in Pittsburgh, if you have an idea, if you see something that you think needs to be changed or a problem that's not being addressed and you have the energy to do it and you have the creativity to do it, you can do it. It's to me, this is one of the most wonderful things about Pittsburgh. And I tell, you know, young uh, law students who work for us as summer clerks, uh, right? And, and, uh, they're debating, well, you know, do I want to stay in Pittsburgh when I want to graduate when I graduate from law school or do I want to go to New York, right? Or uh, Boston. It's like, okay, yeah, you can go there, but you can make a life in Pittsburgh that is so full and rich that you should think about that when you're making your decision. Yeah. I agree. It's it's a great place to live. Um I hesitate to even say it too much because I feel like the secret's going to get out and our cost of living is going to go up. But the fact also that you can get what you can get in Pittsburgh for the amount of money you can currently get it for is, I mean, in my opinion, it's it's kind of amazing and also ridiculous. And I feel like it's it's not going to last very long. Well, I think we should let the secret get out because we could probably handle an influx of another 10,000 incredibly probably, talented yeah. pe people to Pittsburgh. It might drive up the cost of housing a little bit, you know, uh, when everything was spacking, you know, and uh, it looked like every company was going to mint spacking, I like a, that. a bunch of, of uh, multimillionaires. Those of us who lived in Squirrel Hill, which is very close to, I live in Squirrel Hill. right, to East Liberty and the yep. Strip are thinking, oh my God, they're going to increase the price of housing. On the one hand, if you have a house, that's great. Yep. But if you're a young person <laughs> buying a house and you're not a technology executive, what does that mean? Well, uh, the market kind of turned in the other direction and we've minted some millionaires, not as many as we'd like to. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Right. Yeah. So I guess, who do you see coming up in the city that, that you know, maybe is kind of not on the radar yet? Like, what are some of the, the Pittsburgh technology plays that you think are kind of on the horizon? Well, you know, I, I talked before about the fact that the autonomous vehicles industry right now, a lot of it is suffering. Yeah, I agree. Because I mean, Argo because is a huge blow to that industry. It, it's really hard. It's hard to see. This is the nature of capitalism, is that it spawns a lot of startups, spawns a tremendous amount of investment and competition, and they're winners and they're losers. Yep. Uh, a lot of these companies need tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to continue to develop the technology, let alone get a mark, get a something onto the market, they're they're light years away from that, and people were perfectly willing to fund that until earlier this year, when all of a sudden, you know, the 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 wallet snapped shut, and the money wasn't there. Uh, so 
That's that's been hard. Now other autonomous vehicle companies have they got the funding they needed. They're being very careful about it. I think they can get to where they need to go. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of robotics companies, as as I mentioned, that are smaller, that don't have those intense capital needs. Yeah, self driving has kind of been flooded in cash in a yeah, way that I don't yeah. think that other robots. And, and that flood of cash like just it stopped, right? It just it got choked off. So, that makes sense. So when you start getting fed money in that way, you're going to start spending more naturally, and then it becomes more expensive to feed the beast, and yeah. attrition becomes more catastrophic at that point. I have been through at least four severe economic downturns in my career. And, and seeing you know, good companies fail because they needed a lot more cash right at the point where they couldn't get any. Uh, on the other hand, that's a great time for investors to get in because you buy low, sell high, Yep. right? You come into a company when the valuations are down, you make that investment and you're making it in, not just in the product, but in management, it's axiomatic that 80% of a company's value is in management. I haven't heard that yet. Like oh that. yeah, that's that's how VCs look at it. You know, you can, uh, a really great manager can come into an average technology company and make it successful. A bad manager can come into a company with great technology and drive it into the ground in a matter of months. Makes sense. So you really invest in management. Uh, and, and if there's good managers there, and there's and we create technology like crazy in Pittsburgh. It's a great time for investors to be coming in because these investments in five to ten years will be, you know, the big winners. Yeah. And I think that like I said, there's a lot of early stage technology companies that are doing things in robotics, in materials handling. Uh, there's a life science companies that are doing incredible things. We haven't talked much about life sciences, but yeah, that's who, who all. Who are you looking been. at now? Like I'm picturing maybe Omnicell. Yeah, um, well, I mean, Omnicell picked up a, a company that was well established, but there's a lot of early stage companies coming out of Pitt. We we always talk about CMU and robotics, and and rightly so, and software. Well, uh, from a but medical perspective, Pitt's second to none. Pitt is fantastic. Pitt is perennially in the top five in terms of government funding, NIH, uh, and this funding, Spencer, this is non-dilutive funding. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. This is funding, the government says we have a problem that's important, we want to solve it, we're willing to make tens or hundreds of millions of dollars available, and we don't, we don't get a piece of your company. I mean, this, this, this money is amazing money, and, uh, a number of my life sciences company over the years have raised tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, not raised, but they've received it in grants. Through, in, through grants because the DOD, NIH, whoever it is, wants to solve a problem and they can do it. Uh, so that's great in this environment because when private capital is hard to come by, uh, the government funding is is really valuable, and there's so much happening. There's so much coming out of Pitt, you know, new approaches to diagnostics, to drug discovery, to uh, healthcare information. Any companies in particular that you're watching these days? Well, you know, I I actually don't want to. Okay, understood. I, I, yeah, I just can't talk about clients by name. No worries. But 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 they're you know they're doing some uh, amazing things, and. Um, uh, you know, I, I think in the next few years we're going to see the fruits of their labors. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's that's awesome. And I yeah. mean, I've I've definitely been watching a lot of interesting stuff coming up as well. And uh, I don't know that I've got the same vantage point as you, but I, life science is an industry or a market that I, I'm proud to serve when I have. And the same with medicine. And Maybe it's because I've got pretender syndrome because my dad's a doctor and I didn't do that, you know. And I want to, if I can make a medical robot, I'm at least a little bit as good as he is. Yeah, but look, <laughs> whatever drives you, everyone's driven yeah. by something different. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I think what my robotics companies do uh, uh, is really vital to commerce. Yeah. 
I think what my life science companies do is, is vital to the well-being of the nation. Yeah. It sort of has a higher plane in some ways. And uh, I'm gratified to be able to help some of these companies get to the point that they can get a, a, their product or solution to the marketplace and save lives. Yeah. You know, many years ago, uh, I, I worked with a, a life science company that we assisted beyond what was remotely reasonable in terms of how much a law firm should do for a company that doesn't <laughs> have any funding. Uh, but we did, we supported them and they turned the corner and, and they made it. It, it. They were working, one of a number of companies working with, you know, killer T cells. And, uh, what are killer teeth? I mean, well, I'm assuming that's like a white blood cell. Like that... you know, personalized medicine. Okay, interesting. You know, so right. you're introducing something into the bloodstream that can yes. kill a thing that you want to get rid of. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot that's been done in that area. Very, many different approaches. And, and, you know, drug discovery is another area that's incredibly expensive. Uh, to take a, a drug through phase four of clinical trials can cost you know, well over a hundred million or, or right. more. But there's a nice sort of uh, protocol in, in the life sciences industries. You take a drug through phase one, you take it through phase two, if it's showing positive results, that's when you're able to uh, collaborate with a larger biotech pharma company to take it through phase three and phase four. You, you don't have to fund that yourself. You give up some of the upside, but there's tremendous value in what you've created to date. So the question is, how do you raise the money to get through phase one and phase two, which is a challenge. Uh, but at least you can hand it off at some point. The robotics industry how do you is so young, they haven't figured out how to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. What I was going to ask is, as, as a drug company, how do you capitalize at phase phase two or phase three to, to get to phase four, typically? Well, I mean, if, if, if you show incredible, you have to have data, right? Okay. So if you show incredible results after phase two or a phase, you know, one slash two, um, and you want to continue to go solo, there are venture funds and others who are ready, willing, and able to fund that to the next stage. But they're it's, going to vet that data and make sure they're investing in yeah, something smart. Yeah, but it's going to be highly dilutive, right? They're going to put in a ton of money. They're going to expect a lot. Makes sense. Um, uh, but that's, that's okay, right? That's the difference between uh, structural dilution and economic dilution. Structurally, the early investors may own a lot less than they owned early on. But in terms of the economic value of what they own, it's far greater. Oh, interesting. That's always a lecture I give to my I, early, I actually, early stage companies. I'm really interested because I don't, this is not my forte. And so this is, I feel like I'm learning a lot right now. Listen, you know, owning 100% of nothing is nothing. <laughs> owning 10% of something that's worth 500 million is worth 50 million. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not abstract, okay. but, but, uh, founders are very reluctant to give up ownership uh, and they have to get past that because the company needs funding to succeed. But, but you can get a drug discovery company to phase two and that's when you can sell it off to uh, a biotech company or a pharma company who's much better equipped. You know, the, the so they're just in the business of acquiring companies that have gotten through phase two clinicals and bringing them through phase four and then bringing the drug to It's market. an entire industry. Okay. There are, you know, thousands of absolutely brilliant uh, uh, business people and, and technical people who have PhDs and, and uh, business degrees from <laughs> the finest institutions in the world yeah. who do nothing but work on these problems. Yeah. And they, and they do a good job. So if you show data, if you show that, you can solve some, you know, cure disease. I've been following yeah. some of those companies in the medical robotics sector, and it's interesting to see the acquisition. It's it's process. not dissimilar. It's not okay. dissimilar. So you know that that's that's how that works. The difference is that these 
companies can often get a lot of this non-dilutive government funding early on and not take quite as much. But that's only going to take you so far because you can't get the kind of money that you need to get through those later phases through non-dilutive funding, it sounds like. Right. I agree. Okay. That, that's when you need to be able to partner. Yep. Uh, and, and, and so this is where Pittsburgh uh, still has quite a ways to go. Right. We have this critical mass of robotics. That's clear. The Argo experiment has proven that we have a critical mass. Uh, anyone who anyone who left Argo who wants to stay in Pittsburgh is staying in Pittsburgh. They can choose from, you know, a huge number of offers. For if sure. they want to leave, you know, no one's holding. <laughs> it's not indentured servitude. You can leave, but but uh, it, in life sciences. We're getting there, but we have a ways to go. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I love that you're working on that market. It is it is one of my favorite markets. And so it's just good to know that um, from your vantage point, you see it being something that's growing and, and is going to continue I do. to blossom I do. here in this city. So this is the ADD thing I was talking about. Yeah. I got life sciences over here. I got robotics over here. They sometimes overlap. They sometimes overlap. Usually they don't. Uh, but they're all exciting companies. They're all doing great things. Uh, and the fact is, when I started, when I decided to go to law school, I never intended to become a technology lawyer or business lawyer. I thought this was going to be my shortcut to getting into the State Department or the Department of Defense working on international affairs, which I found fascinating. That's interesting. That's, that's what I thought I was going to do. What made you want to do that at the time? Well, because I'd had a fantastic professor in college. He was a Middle East expert, Iran. And this was 1978, 1979, when the Shah was being overthrown. Interesting. We've all seen the results of that. <laughs> uh, and he was one of the world's foremost experts on Iran. So I, I was completely drawn to it. I thought, well, that's what I want to do for a living. But I don't want to get a PhD in international relations. I'll get a law degree. And that'll be my in. And then I made law review, uh, and I don't know yeah, how much you know about that, but when you make law review, Not a ton, to be honest. You, you become, a, well, it's like you were the top 10% of your class. Oh, cool. So you're attractive, you're an attractive candidate to law firms. I'd never thought about working for a law firm, and I'd never thought about making money. That was the furthest thing from my mind. But I got an offer, and I worked for a law firm, and I thought it was interesting. And then I went to New York, and it was more interesting. And you know the, the international affairs thing kind of fell away, and I got into what I got into, which is what happens in a career. Yep. You sort of create opportunities for yourself and that you didn't expect, and then you follow them. And before you know it, you're doing something completely different than what you set out to do. It's amazing what paths you'll go down when somebody offers you what you perceive to be a large amount of money for you at the time. <laughs> well, yes. I, I will say it's not like I was it's not like I sold out to be an investment banker. Lawyers make a nice living, but it's nothing like that. It was just the work was incredibly interesting and the people were interesting. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I could do that and get paid. All right, I'll try that. I'll see what that's like. If I don't like it, I'll do something else. Nice. Yeah. It's a healthy attitude, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So many people, I think, and I've actually seen this with friends that have been involved in the, the Argo situation. You know, they're just, you know, we've talked and, you know, people will say to me, you know, it's, it's easy to think I'm not going to be able to feed myself in a few months. But, you know, then I got to realize I've got a really valuable skill set and I'm going to be fine. You know, and so... I think that's important to kind of keep in mind of because, like you mentioned, you've been through four economic downturns. I mean, and I've seen 2008, and then recently, it's about all I've all I've experienced. And so, I mean, it's it's scary, but it's not it's not the end of the world. I mean, well, what goes up, what goes up must come down. What yeah. goes down must come up. Uh, and and I'm maybe I'm a little sanguine about it because I've been through it so many times, but that in fact is true. And you just have to kind of grit your teeth and gut it out through the downturn and through the difficult times. If you're passionate about what you're doing, if you love what you're doing, if you think you're making a difference, you will succeed. Money will follow. 
if you do it just for the money, I, 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 you know, I don't want to be hackneyed to say, well, if you do it just for the money, you're never going to make money. That's not true. There's lots of people who do it just for the money and are very successful. Yep. But I have found the people who are most satisfied <laughs> with what they've done are the people who are passionate about it. And all of a sudden, the money's there. Yep. And I will tell you, what I've seen time and time again is when it happens, when the journey has reached this point, it could be a conclusion because the money's there. It's of almost no consequence because that's not what they were looking for at the outset. Nice. It wasn't to make a lot of money. It was to make a difference. And the money's there, and that's nice, but they continue to go after their goals. I think that's, uh, that's definitely true. I've, I've, I've seen it time and time again, right? Now, this is the world of entrepreneurs. Yeah. I can't speak to the world of investment bankers and hedge fund managers. You know, they it's operate, a different world. They operate on a different plane. Uh, so, you know, they do what they do and they're very good at it. Uh, but in the world I live in, the ecosystem that you live in, yep. that I live in, it's different. For sure. And I, I have plenty of friends. I, I, have, I have one buddy who has salaried himself at, I don't know, we'll say like a, what would, below the poverty line. But I mean, he, him and I have a running friendly competition to see who can make the most amount of money. And it's, neither of us are trying to do that, but it sometimes will happen. And so we're like, hey, what, what do you do? You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I did this. What do you do? I did this. And, you know, I, I think the beauty of it is, you know, when you're expect it's it's almost like dating. It's like when you're expecting to, you know, like go out and meet someone, it never happens. But then when you're just, you know, in it because you're passionate, and, you know, you just want to, you know, do your thing and, you know, you're, that's when everything works that's, out. That's, and, that's you know. the serendipity. Yeah. I say this having just celebrated the 40th anniversary of my first date with my wife. Congratulations. So I know, I know it's, I know it's serendipity. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm older than most of your guests, but you know, that's, that's the serendipity of it. Uh, you just kind of let life come to you. And, uh, I think that passion is really important to uh, feeling fulfilled. We want to feel like we're making a difference. You want to wake up in the morning thinking, I'm making a difference. I'm helping people. I'm helping them to succeed. And, uh, you know, whether you're, you know, just starting your career or you're looking back over a career, that, that's, that's what you can look to. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So should we talk about the JRS stuff? Would that be too divergent? Which stuff? Uh, Jewish Residential Services. Sure, I'd be happy to. I'd be curious. So the story I always told, told got told is that my grandmother kind of helped to start this organization in the 80s. I don't know if that's true or not. I think it is true. Okay. So, uh, so we're going to totally switch gears here. All right, fair enough. And hopefully your audience will bear with us. Yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> no, no. I, I think it's a really important story because I think yeah. it can translate to other communities. It's not just the Jewish community. Yeah. But in the Jewish community, which is uh, has been for decades very organized in terms of assisting those in need, there was one group that probably was ignored and those were adults with chronic mental illness and their families. Uh, they felt like they were not part of the community, that their plight was not recognized because it's uncomfortable to recognize mental illness. It's uncomfortable to realize that we're not addressing it. And so your grandmother along with a number of other people said, we need to create our own organization to help these members of our community and their families to have a better life, a better path. That was the creation of Jewish residential services. We weren't just helping the people who were living in this facility, it was their families who, uh, you know, had a, an adult child with a severe uh, issue and they wondered what's going to happen when I die, who's going to take care of my son, my daughter. 
and and that's how Jewish residential services got started. That's awesome. And eventually, I I would say, uh, and not long after it started, the Jewish community sort of recognized this was really important, and they became a beneficiary agency of the uh, Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh in a, in a big way. Cool. And so now JRS is absolutely part of the community. But the yeah. fact is, your grandmother, and I don't know what drove her. I don't know if there was this issue in your family. I think it was to do with uh, her daughter uh, at the time, who had schizophrenia. So my aunt. Yes, she was one of the yeah. early, pa thank you for reminding me. No worries. She was one of the early residents. Your grandmother and your Good grandfather. friend of mine, by the way. I right. love cooking with her. She's a great aunt. What's that? So my aunt, who, who we're talking about, said it's a great person. She's a positive influence in my life. She's, she's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so your grandmother, your grandfather were solidly behind this. My, my cousin, Debbie Friedman, who is amazing, was the founding executive director of oh, cool. JRS. She got me involved. I was the first president of the organization who did not have an experience of a family member who had chronic mental illness. What got you interested in getting involved? Like, how did you get roped in? Well, this is what happens in this community. <laughs> uh, by David Greenberg, uh, an insurance... Name. Do you know David? I know the name. I'm trying so to think how I can place David, him. David, very successful insurance agent, great guy. His son, Chuck who later went on to become a uh, part owner of the Texas Rangers, was one of my partners. David approached me and said, uh, JRS is looking for some board members. We think you'd be a good board member. And David asked. Because he asked, I said yes. <laughs> That's how it works. I yeah, said fair yes. Enough. I had no history with this. I had no vested interest in it. But David asked me, and I said yes. That makes sense. And then a year later, I was, I was president of the organization, and and boy, we were we were just uh, that was an incredibly explosive time for JRS. When would this have been approximately? This was like the mid nineties. Okay, got it. So we we solidified Stacy House where your aunt lived. I think she was a resident there. I think. I haven't confirmed that with her, but I believe you. Check that out. Yeah. We created a clubhouse where people could We're come having, during having the day. Lunch in a couple of weeks. So yeah, here. the clubhouse, and we created supported housing for people who could live sort of semi-independently but needed some help. We created another uh, housing uh, for people with developmental disabilities, which is different than having a, a chronic mental illness. And this was all Debbie's doing. I happened to be president of the organization. I just clung to my cousin's coattails while she did all these amazing things. This is kind of a dumb question, but I'm just curious. What's the difference between a developmental disability and a chronic mental illness? Well, chronic mental illness is something like schizophrenia or okay. bipolar disorder. Makes sense. Developmental disability is something that someone's fundamentally born with, with uh, a, an issue that creates I know I'm not describing it accurately because I've been so removed from it. Yeah, no worries. But someone who's been, you know, all their lives is unable to learn or, or to. Uh, that also sounds, sounds chronic, chronic, though, because that's persistent. Well, it's chronic, it's but it's, it's there from day one. Whereas yeah. uh, schizophrenia and bipolar you disorder, can have late onset. The, these these emerge in the late teenage years yep. or early twenties. Yeah, right? makes sense. Uh, so, uh, forgive me for not being precise on this. I hope that the community will forgive me for not being precise, but... No, oh, I'm just a curious <laughs> guy and I have questions. It's a good question. I should have a better answer. That's on the right. other hand, it was like 25 years ago. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, you know, so I did that. But, you know, that was my first leadership role in the Jewish community. Yeah. Uh, and, for, and because of that, I was on the board of the Jewish Federation, and uh, that was about the time, if you're interested, which I, I imagine you are, uh, we were doing work with free markets, which was one of Pittsburgh's great technology successes. And what is that in this context? I'm sorry? You said free markets. Free markets. Do you know free markets? 
I know what a free market is. Well, free markets was a company that okay. was worth it. When they went public, they were worth nine billion dollars. Holy moly! Yeah, this was in two thousand, and then uh, they they got hit in two thousand and one. They were worth about three billion dollars. Ah, brutal! But they were they were an incredible success for a long period of time. It was founded by a guy named Glenn Meekum. Uh, Glenn had called me up and said, we're trying to recruit a Jewish engineer. We know that you're deeply involved in the Jewish community. We know that this guy cares about the Jewish community. We'd like your help in recruiting him. And so uh, I did. I mean, I went out to lunch with the guy and I talked to him about Pittsburgh and what a great Jewish community we have and why it's so special. He didn't take the job. <laughs> I think he lost like tens of millions of dollars by not doing it. Brutal. But it made me think about the fact that Pittsburgh was struggling to attract and retain uh, young Jewish adults, many of whom had left because they didn't see a future for themselves here. And That's the technology community was burgeoning. And I thought, well, someone should figure out how to connect the two of those things and, and, and make something happen. And Karen Shapira of Blessed Memory, who was the chair of the Jewish Federation, said, that's a great idea. Why don't you do something about it? <laughs> I said, fine. So they gave me some funding. They connected me with a lot of amazing people, including Sue Berman Kress, who I have to just say her name because she's remarkable and thoughtful and caring. And a group of us created Shalom Pittsburgh which was an organization designed to attract and retain young Jewish adults in Pittsburgh. This all came from David Greenberg saying, you should serve on the board of JRS. That's amazing. What happens is if you get involved in the community, it never stops. It, and I say that in a good way. Yeah. Uh, it's up to you to decide how far do you want to take it. Do you want to just do what you're asked to do? Or do you want to take it to the next level? Do you want to create an organization? I did the same thing 20 years later when I helped to create 412 by 972. You helped to create that? Yeah, yeah. yeah you know Gal's been on this podcast too. I know, yeah. I know. That's why I'm here. I nice. mean, I'm, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of Gal. Yeah. But You may have mentioned that to me, by the way. I apologize. No, no, no. I mean, uh, the, the, it, if you want to make a difference, yeah. That Pittsburgh is the place to do it. Yeah. So I thought, let's attract and retain young Jewish adults. Hey, let's connect Israeli technologies with Pittsburgh technologies. And if you have that idea, the community is there to support you. It's not easy. They don't support you on day one. It might take, oh, I don't know, four years <laughs> for something to come to fruition. But if you care about it and you're persistent. Gal is certainly that. Gal is that, right? <laughs> the, he, Gal made the difference. We had this idea. We spent years working on it. But it's like a tech company. Remember what I said about 80% of a tech company management. is uh, management? Well, like 90% of 412 by 972 is Gal. It's, it's the guy who gets there and makes it happen. And he's been incredibly successful in pulling together Pittsburgh and Israel. Yeah, he's a hustler. I've been really impressed by his work ethic and some of his techniques for just managing their client load. And then also, I don't know, I mean, just, just the amount of things he's able to run in parallel effectively is, is super impressive to me. He is uh, incredibly disciplined. He is passionate, passionate about our goal, both for Israel and for Pittsburgh. He did, I mean, I... I'm sure when we first approached him, he had never either heard, he heard of CMU, but he hadn't heard of Pittsburgh, like a lot of Israelis. They've heard of Carnegie Mellon University, they have no idea where it is. That I think they sense. think it's in, in the Valley or in Boston. That's hilarious. Uh, but he's passionate about it and he's done a tremendous job. I'm very gratified by that. And I'm excited about, you know, we just had Robotics Discovery Day. That was a great it, event. Yeah, it was a great event. And Al uh, Gal brought eight companies over from Israel to participate. And, yep. and, and now they're really uh, enchanted 
by Pittsburgh and they want to sponsor events for the Pittsburgh Robotics Network, they want to be involved and engaged. Yeah. Uh, Gal made it happen, right? Yeah, and I've been enjoying all those guys, and it's it's been fun. Gal's been making tons of intros between me and, and folks in Israel, and a bunch of them have been on the podcast. And, yeah, uh, you yeah. Know, it's been it's been super rewarding. I mean, I think I mentioned Brian Beyer. He's the one that introduced me to Gal Inbar. Yeah, and so that's how I met that guy. And you know, it's I mean, you talk about the Jewish community, you do one thing, and all this stuff unfolds. I feel like that's also true of the Robox community. It is. You know, where you and I love the, the fact door. that, you know, we've been able to connect the robotics community, the Jewish community. Jeff Cohen, uh, formerly the chief medical officer at Allegheny Health Network, is brilliant and, and a huge proponent of, and, and he's now uh, leading uh, Alpha Lab Health. Oh, cool. Is a huge proponent Big fan. of bringing in companies from Israel and all over the world to solve healthcare problems. We have such incredible resources here. People who are just so passionate about changing the face of robotics, of healthcare, of, of, of relations between countries. We're very fortunate. Yeah, I agree. I, um, I couldn't think of anywhere else I'd rather live, to be honest. It's, it's, it's a, a good great time place. to be alive. It's a great place to be. I think I mentioned to you before we started uh, the the podcast officially that I'm committed to Pittsburgh. My my family and my wife's family all arrived in Pittsburgh around 1890. Oh, cool! From Vilna, from Lithuania, as Jews were fleeing uh, the czar and uh, the pogroms that were happening. Yeah, it's, unfortunately, you know, happens a lot. Yeah, you know, 50 years before the Holocaust, and they made their way to Pittsburgh. And, and uh, created this community. And, uh, you know, we, we feel so entwined with Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh's success. And every generation has its own challenge to meet. And we feel like, you know, we're meeting it with what, with what we do. Yep. Uh, but it's, it's very rewarding. But the crap our, our grandparents and great grandparents had to do is insane. I mean, you mentioned the pogroms and, Leaving Europe, I mean, my family, I think, came here a bit later than yours, probably in the 1910s, maybe yeah. early 1900s, yeah. with the first shop that became the, the tea, you know, with that was my great-grandfather, Max Azen. And, um, I, I mean, you know, it's, I think he was a street peddler in Latvia. I remember Azen. That's the story I was told, of, you know. Yeah, yeah. People came here with nothing. Yeah. And they had an incredible sense of entrepreneurialism because they needed to eat. <laughs> uh, and 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 some of them were very, not all of them were successful, but many of them were, and uh, they grew businesses, and their kids have have, you know, gone out and and changed the world, uh, and Susan and I, my wife and I, happened to stay in Pittsburgh, whereas you know many of our contemporaries left, you know they went to New York, to Boston, to London, you know you name it, that's where people went to, but. We, we thought this was such a amazing community. This this would be where we would make our lives and our families. Yeah, and I'll probably stay here myself, to be honest. I, I really love it. I that. hope so. I hope so. Yeah. You know, uh, the siren song of other cities, other countries is strong. And, and I think people should explore it. Yeah. But ultimately, uh, I can't think of a better place <laughs> to raise a family. Siren is a good way to, to put it. Yeah, and, and honestly, I kind of agree with you. I mean, I've, I've probably moved about nine times in my life, and I've lived in Los Angeles, I've lived in Boston, I've lived in Utah, I've lived in Connecticut, um, I've lived in Cleveland, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, uh, Milwaukee, but and I always come back here because it's my favorite place to live. <laughs> and so. it, it, it's the touchstone, right? Yeah. And it's okay if you leave again, by the way. I'm not oh, suggesting thanks. you do, but if you leave, you know, learn you know figure things out then you know then bring them back bring to, that knowledge bring, bring, then bring it back to Pittsburgh bring <laughs> it back to back Pittsburgh again. and make a difference right I mean, yeah well, and I, and I think that's it I mean you mentioned traveling through North Africa and Europe and the Middle East when you were you know just completing law school and trying to figure it out and I think for me it's important too to travel it's it's the most 
mind expanding experience I've had in my life is just seeing other people and realizing we're not all that different, you know, anywhere in the world. And so I don't, I mean, I love Pittsburgh. I grew up here. I mean, I, I went to Penguins games when I was in diapers, you know, probably. And so, I mean, I, I, I've really enjoyed kind of living in the city, but I also feel like like the world isn't all that different anywhere. And like you said, you can bring that knowledge back. And I, I, in my year day. abroad, which was uh, 1979 to 19, September of 79 to September of 80, I met so many amazing people in every country who were kind and warm and caring uh, and it, it, it gave me a world view that was very different than the one I had from just, you know, my academic pursuits, yeah. uh, which is, tends to focus on big events and big personalities, big people. Wars. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th this was a different experience and I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I think people should expose themselves to that. I remember I went to Morocco maybe four years ago and um, I, I was emceeing a wedding in Portugal and I took a side trip to Morocco and that's one of my favorite countries in the world by the way like, I love Morocco I'm a Moroccan supremacist all the way but um, I remember one of the things I, I really liked was um, just to go and everybody was so warm and welcoming and you know just yeah come on over you know and I, I just thought it was it was great and it made me a better person to have experienced that. And so here's the irony. Yeah. I spent a week in Morocco on my travels, and that was the most memorable week of my year abroad in many ways because of the people that I met, the experiences that we had, so informative. It took, I don't know, you know, 40 years before we went back to Morocco as an adult, an established adult. And I found it very interesting, but not nearly as evocative as being there in my early That's interesting. early twenties. I I enjoyed it, but the, the, the it paled in comparison to the impact that had on me as a twenty two year old. Right? Yeah. To go back as a sixty two year old or however old I was. Why do you think that was? I don't know. I, yeah. I think you know, when uh Maybe I'm so entrenched in my worldview and my life uh, at the age I am now, as opposed to being wide-eyed and wide open yeah. as a 20-year-old, that I just, I just viewed it differently. It could be. One of the things that I really liked about it was, well, it I guess struck me is I, I read TripAdvisor because I had the internet before I went. And, I looked up all these reviews and people's experiences and this one woman talked about being held up at knife point and just terrifying, a horrible, dangerous place. And I think my parents read this stuff and it got in their head and, you know, there was some fear there initially, but then, I mean, I already said when I went there, people were so nice. It was like the friendliest welcome I've ever had anywhere in the world. Maybe Belgium as well was, was kind of similar, but I, I just, it was interesting to see that there could be like, you know, like you said, with your history where you, you focused on big events. You know, when I read into this place, I saw dangerous, you know, person being held up at knife point. You know, you're going to keep your head on a swivel. And then I went there and people couldn't have been nicer. You know, yeah. Was... When, when I traveled, Spencer, we didn't have, obviously, we didn't have the Internet, yeah. right? We had these books, guidebooks that were designed for, you know, young people in their 20s who were traveling. You know where to live for you know where to stay for next to nothing what to go see awesome. for next to nothing and and they were uniformly positive uh and 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 so that that was my my attitude when i went any place was the excitement and and the positive nature of where we were going nice and by the way it didn't hurt that uh before i went to places that were really incredibly meaningful like rome i would try to read Jealous ahead of time some historical I love historical fiction yeah. so I read The Agony and the Ecstasy before I went to Rome about Michelangelo oh, cool. so when I was in the Sistine Chapel and all the, the Medici chapels my god I felt like I was, I was touching history that's wild you know, it, was a, it was a great way to travel if anyone's listening to this and thinking of traveling read up Do ahead it. of time you know, and get excited about where you're going
Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I had no fear, no fear yeah. whatsoever. Yeah, and I, I think that's it. Like, even if you're, I've had fear, but you have to pack it in and, you know, just, you know, go go in strong and, and confident and, you know, not be worried about what's going to happen. Because if you, if you sulk into fear and if you, if you get too anxious and too paranoid and, and you worry about, you know, what's this person going to take from me? What do I have to lose? Am I going to get robbed? Am I going to get killed? Blah, 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 blah. Then you're just, you're never going to nah, be able to make friends. Know, let, or, let your parents yeah. worry about that. That's what parents do. Um, I, I mean, I found with my children. That. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my children uh, will travel and they'll just, you know, they're just going to go out and do it. And I try to remember how my mother must have felt. My dad died in 1977. Sorry. So she was a widow and her son's going off for this year abroad. We have no way of staying in touch, right? <laughs> there was no, again, no internet, no phone. You just call her on the cell phone in and, the 1970s. And it's like, it's like, you know, she was brave in her own way to just yeah. like say, go, go do this thing. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the approach that the people should take. Conversely, I had to block my parents on, on the WhatsApp because they kept calling me and worrying. And I was like, this is too much. You're cut off. Don't worry about me. I, I, I'm blocking you consciously. I, I, need a, I need a week to myself. One of the great things about my trip was that I was completely dissociated from my entire family That's awesome. and friends in the U.S. for a year. We had this, you could write letters on these, this little thin blue stationery <laughs> that you would fold up and send. For like I don't know, a couple of pennies. Nice. Uh, that's how we stayed in touch, and it was great because you you learn how to be uh, independent, you learn how to be on your own, you learn how to make decisions. Uh, again, I sound like an old guy, but the fact is uh, that was that was lucky. That's awesome. Well, that, that this stuff is to interesting to me because I didn't have that perspective. I've almost always had the option of a phone and. When I haven't, it's been weird. <laughs> I know that we we this is how we've learned to live. Yeah. It's how we've learned to live. But there was there was something to be said for getting off the grid. I agree. Well, and but I mean to to the benefits of right now. I mean, I, some of my best friends don't even live in the city, you know, and I'm able to keep in touch. My my buddy Uriel Eisen, who's been on the podcast, he owns a company that makes um, buckles for the adventure sport industry and really high-end uh, aluminum and titanium buckles. He grew up in uh, Israel for a little bit. Um, they, uh, him and I, he lives in Seattle now. He has a little you know, factory and a barn in Kingston, uh, which is actually across from Seattle, but you know, nearby. Um, him and I talk like probably every other day. You know, we're, we're really good friends, but you know, which that is great, be possible to right? talk. There's, 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 there are many upsides to instant communication among people. But there are downsides, like anything, right? For sure. Right? Nothing is black and white. So, you know, I appreciate, uh, I I appreciate having had that lack of communication. On the other hand, with my children, (laughs) I appreciate (laughs) having the, having the communication when I need it. How many kids do you have? We have three. Nice. Yeah, we have three. Our son, boys, girls, both. Uh, a boy. Uh, our son Will is uh, uh, is now thirty four. Nice. He's my age. Yeah, he's your age. Yeah. And and our daughter Hannah is thirty two. Rachel's awesome. twenty eight. Nice. Our son Will uh, discovered and promoted Mac Miller. FYI. Oh, cool. Yeah, him and I went to Winchester Thurston together. Did you really? He was two years younger than me. Yeah. Well, Will is Willie Whips. Oh, cool. If if you uh, followed that at all. So yeah, we'll we'll discover well, yeah, that when, <laughs> when he was in high school and promoted him for a number of years. So we've had that interesting part of our life. That's our awesome. Our daughter Hannah teaches at the JCC. She's a Jewish educator, and Rachel's in New York working for Forbes. So that yeah, us. all of our kids are finding their ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is fun. I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any kids yet, and I, I don't know if I will or not, but I may. Um, but just watching like me and my brother and sister grow up, you know, from my parents and seeing the different paths we're taking and, you know, we're all kind of serial entrepreneurs in our own right. And it's kind of fun to see, you know, who's doing well at what times. And then, you know, somebody might have, you know, a little bit of a rough spell and then 
the other ones will prop them up. You that's know, great. And, and yeah, no, we, that's, we get that's a lot what of you need. That's what families are all about. Yeah. And uh, well, I, for your sake, for our sake, I hope one day you'll say, yeah, I do want to have children, uh, because uh, it's incredibly gratifying. So what about it? Like, how did how did you? I guess how did it change your life to have kids? Because this is something I've been on the fence about for a while. And you seem like a persuasive fellow, so. Well, I, you know, uh, it's it's funny you ask that because when I came of age, there was sort of little doubt that if we were able to, we would have children. It was just sort of the natural order of things. I came from a family of three. My wife came from a family of three, so we figured we would have three kids. Uh, we weren't thinking about the state of the world and and, you know, uh, how god awful it might become. Uh, we were thinking of how joyful it would be to have yeah. children and to to raise them and to hopefully raise you know wonderful adults who would make you know be happy, maybe make a difference. Uh, and it, it wasn't a hard decision. We were we were thrilled. It's interesting as we look at our own kids, and and a lot of people of their generation, they think quite a bit about the state of the world, climate change and other things. And can they bring someone into this world? Yeah, that weighs into it for me. It definitely, it weighs into it from every one of your generation. And uh, I, I, I hope it won't dissuade you and others from doing it because it takes good people to change the way things are. You know, we can change it to the extent we're able, and then we need the next generation to step up and change it. If we don't produce the next generation, someone's going to. Yep. <laughs> I would like to think that, you know, our kids can really help to change things in a good way. And my, I have a four-year-old grandson. He's fantastic. That's awesome. Ezra, he's the light of our eyes, of nice. our life. And, you know, he, he's wonderful. It's great. This will be his world in 30 years, 40 yeah, years, sure. right? So that's that's kind of how I look at it. All right, well, that's, I'm uh, a little sentimental about it. No, no, no. It's it's a good perspective, and I, I like hearing that because I've heard the argument like, well, that can be a clone of you, and I'm like, I don't know if that's compelling to me. But if you're looking at the big picture and, you know, what's the most positive impact you can have and... You know, I don't know that my kid's not going to turn out to be like a dictator, but at the same time, you hope. I think you can assume <laughs> not going to be a dictator. <laughs> but I, 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 you know, I, I think you just have to have faith that people can do the right thing and change the world. I don't want to get deeply into politics. No worries. Yeah. But I will say that this last election was heartwarming for me because there were a lot of people running from office who were bad people. Do you mean the um, the gubernatorial one? Yeah, in yeah. particular, right? Yeah. The guy who was running for the Republican office, not a good person. Uh, and and I'm, I'm stating this mildly. Yeah. Very scary. And yeah. made me fear for the future of this commonwealth. He was defeated by a massive margin, as big as I've ever seen in a Pennsylvania gubernatorial race. Wow. So that made me think, okay, you know, the pendulum of life and politics swings back and forth. It, it swung in one direction, scarily. Yep. I feel like it's coming back again uh, and, and, and that we can be hopeful for the future, that people will make good, that the collective wisdom will be to make good decisions, important decisions. And that will come from your generation. And God willing, it'll come from your, your children's As generation. generation. Yeah, yeah. They have to be there to make those decisions. And if they're not there, they can't make those decisions. That's a very utilitarian outlook by the way. Well, I like that, but, though, because but, I'm a little bit nihilistic, and so that, no, that actually don't, appeals no, to me. No, don't give in to nihilism. Absolutely. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. There's no reason to. There's so much, there is so much good that's happening. Yeah. You know, shield yourself from that. Just, you know, put up a little screen and say, ah, that's over there. This is over here. 
That's good of you. I appreciate it's it. It's a pretty interesting yeah. podcast. Huh? I don't know yeah, if people like talk about stuff like this. No, it podcast. always ends up getting philosophical to some extent. I so hope so. Usually it starts professional and then, you know, we sort of go off into tangents about people's life stories and then we talk philosophy a bit. And, and Listen, kind of, our, our, yeah, our it's work... It's a guaranteed intellectual conversation. Our, our work is a part of what we do. It is yeah. not all of what we do. It's not all of who we are. Yeah, we I identify agree. greatly with our work, with our professions, with our careers. And when you get to be my age, even more so. But you have to remember that that's, it's part of who you are, but it's not entirely who you are. Yeah, I, I agree. It's difficult when you're, when you're a bit of a workaholic and you're trying to push the envelope. It's, it's easy to get sucked up into your professional identity, and I know I do from time to time. But I think it's important, like you said, to realize there's other aspects. I've been trying to go to more Jewish events. Like I said, this is me kind of yeah. reflecting on some of the stuff you brought up. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think I mentioned this to you before we started recording. Like, I'm, I'm not religious at all, but I, I, you know, I'm ethnically Jewish. I mean, I, I was raised by a Jewish family, and I, I think that the cultural aspects are pretty interesting and pretty cool. And I, I have plenty of Jewish peers and colleagues I respect the hell out of. And uh, I don't know. I've been trying. Like the Alex, beauty of Judaism is yeah. there are many gradations. Now that's how I look at it. Yeah. I, you know, we we have uh, we are hardly monolithic, uh, despite what others may say, and and some of us would say there's only one you know right way, one true way. Yeah, but that's horseshit. Right, and others yeah. of us would say there are many ways to express one's Judaism, and it evolves over years and decades. Uh, and it may be cultural. It may never be anything other than cultural, and that's not, that's that's not nothing. That's important. But it, it, you may find in time that it's more meaningful in other ways, uh, as life throws uh, difficult things in your in your path, throws curveballs at you that you didn't expect. And you may find, as you look for a deeper meaning, that it's actually there if you're willing to. Look for it. So as a source of inspiration, as a source of guidance. As Absolutely. A source of identity, all of the above. Hey, man, we've been around for 2,000 years <laughs> in the face of unbelievable odds. I thought it was like five, but maybe I, I'm getting Well, I'm a, I, yes, we've been around for 5,000 years, but I'm thinking in particular from when we were tossed out of uh, Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, and, and uh, you know, needed to somehow survive. And we did so, you know, with the Torah, with the book. And uh, we found a way of living, an ethical way of living, yeah. with rules and uh, and and commandments. And I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments, but I'm talking about how you should live your life. And we're still here, despite you know unbelievable paroxysms of of, uh, of violence and yeah, that's a good and, point. Uh, and hate. And it's not that isn't just. Uh, a fact of cultural Judaism, it goes much deeper than that. And when the time is right for you, uh, you may find that it's there and you just need to peel it back a little bit, uncover it. Yep. Yeah, now you and my, you and my grandfather would agree in that regard. He's, he's always been trying to, you know, he, he said to me a lot when he was still here, he's like, never forget where you came from. And I'm right. like, ah, I'm my own person, screw you, granddad, you don't know no, anything. No, no. No, <laughs> so. you've, you'll, you'll find your own way, yeah. uh, and it'll come in fits and starts. Yeah. But there's a tremendous support system in the Jewish community. And yeah. uh, you, know, you can seek it out, it can find you, whatever it is. And uh, it, it, it adds to a very rich life, yep. in my experience. That's awesome. I, I've been trying to do that. Like I've been going to the Chabad Young Professional events and attempting to, to get kind of switched into it. I don't know. Do you want to make any intros? I'm I'm certainly open. Oh, I know who to introduce you to. There's a lot of people to a lot of people to introduce you to. Sweet. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that, Dave. You bet. Cool. So, anything else? Uh, I feel like we're at like a good natural stopping point. And no, I think this is good. We've 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 covered a lot of ground. Yeah, it's always I, fun. I, 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 love doing I hope this. I hope your listeners are going to find this interesting. Uh, a lot of it, I guess, was autobiographical. But I ah, hope, that's the whole point of this. But I, I hope there, you know, something in there for people, whatever uh, drives them, whatever they're looking for. Uh, you know, I, I had 
wonderful mentors my entire career. And I've tried to be a mentor to people in, in my firm and into the Jewish community, maybe you know, to listeners, uh, to the extent any of this resonates. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to- Thanks for coming on, Dave. I really appreciate it. it. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you. It's a uh, lot of fun. Is there anything you want to plug on the tail end? I always ask this. And then I'll, I'll give a sponsorship thing just to cheapen everything we've talked about. Oh, I, I guess I would say, you know, if, if the entrepreneurs are still listening after we got off onto the philosophy that, you know, if they, if they feel like they, they heard things from me that could help them, they should reach out. And, the best and way this, to get is easy, you. this is easy. Yeah. It's david.calson, D-A-V-I-D dot K-A-L-S-O-N at Denton's, D-E-N-T-O-N-S dot com. I don't think I mentioned to you on air, yeah. we talked about this before, but when we combined with Denton's three years ago, we became part of the largest law firm in the world, which has been very exciting. It's opened up a lot of resources. So if any of your listeners are interested in what that could do for them, they should reach out to me. Yeah. That, I, that's, that's my plug. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a cool. good one. Cool. And I feel like that's, uh, I don't know, just from the conversation we've had, there's there's definitely real value there. And I encourage anyone to reach out. And if for some reason that spelled out email address didn't make sense, which it definitely should, call <laughs> me and I'll connect to you. <laughs> thank you, Spencer. Thank you, David. Yeah, this um, was great. And then real quick, I just want to say uh, this episode of Collaborative with uh, Spencer Krauss and every episode is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. SKA, Custom Robots and Machines. Well done. You have a, you have a great radio voice. Thanks, David. I appreciate that. All right. I worked really hard on it. <laughs>